Okay, I'll uh, kick it off. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Nikolic. I'm the chair of the uh, 802 Landman Standards Committee that's part of the Computer Society, and this is the second of two webinars that we're giving. Uh, and uh, we're fortunate today to have the chairs from two of our large wireless standards development groups, uh, Dorothy Stanley who leads the 802.11 Wireless Land Group. And uh, she's coming to us from Northeast Ohio. And Pat Kinney, who leads the 802.15 Wireless Specialty Networks, is uh, with us. And he's coming to us from Chicago, Illinois. And I am located in uh, northern New Jersey. So uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the uh, webinar. And Ritu, I'll hand it off to you uh, to give us the introduction on the uh, Computer Society Standards Activities Board. Sure, Paul. Thanks, thanks a lot. So welcome, everyone, to the CS Tab webinar series. My name is Ritu Sethi. Um, I'm the Vice Chair of the Standards Activities Board, and I'll be your webinar moderator today. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to take care of some of the housekeeping items out of the way. The webinar is being recorded, and the slides and recording will be made available after the webinar. You can ask your questions in the question and answer panel. Today's presenters can answer as many questions as possible following today's presentation. Uh, since we have two, three speakers today, if you have a question related directly to what they've covered, please address the question to them when you type it into the chat box. Otherwise, I will leave it open for either of them to answer. And if your question is relating to a particular slide, please do your best to reference that particular slide. Uh, let, let me start with uh, briefly introducing you to the IEEE CS Standards Activities Board mission and the various active standard committees that it foresees. Um, let's uh, start with that. Um, so the mission of the IEEE Computer Society Standard Activity Boards is to encourage uh, the CS members to participate in standardization activities and to promote the use of IEEE standards as best as they can, and to develop useful products that leverage IEEE standards within the scope of the Computer Society. Uh, moreover, the mission of SAB is to promote and further industry participation and engagement through standards, but also through other activities, um, right? So there are, if, if I have to look at uh, many of these committees, uh, if we go by the CSAB, by the numbers and the various active committees, uh, we have, you know, the numbers for you to go through. Uh, there are a lot of uh, projects, active projects, work groups that are uh, communicated, uh, you know, through their standards committees, and they they work in tandem. Uh, today, in um, in the series, in these webinar series that we are going to introduce them to you, we are covering the uh, the 802 dot uh, series, where, which are local area networking and uh, metropolitan area networking standards committee, which has been active over the past 40 years and has been essential in enabling suppliers of data communication components, products, systems, and services to be delivered economically and at immense scale. So we had our first of these two-part series uh, last month. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have attended, but the recording is available if you want to have, if you did miss it. Uh, in this, the second part, um, we had uh, a word from Paul, um, the chair of IEEE 802, uh, and we will today explore the 802's wireless family of standards with Dorothy and uh, at uh, with us, the breadth of the 802 fa wireless family and its future will also be explored. Let me also introduce our, spe our speakers uh, whom we've already met. Uh, Paul is focused on developing new ventures, technologies, technical standards, and intellectual property in the data communications and broadband industries as an angel investor and broad board member of early stage companies. He's an IEEE fellow and the chairman of the IEEE 802 Land and Man Standards Committee. 
is also a partner in Yas Broadband Ventures, LLC, and holds several patents. Uh, the second in line, the speaker, uh, Dorothy Stanley, is an HPE fellow and head of standard strategy at Aruba. A, uh, it's a HP enterprise company. She's, she currently serves as chair of the IEEE 802.11 working group and has chaired several task groups in the, in the 802.11 working group. She's also a consulting member of the technical staff at Agere Systems for Waveland products and a distinguished member of the technical staff at Lucent Technologies and AT&T Bell Labs in her earlier days. Uh, the, the third speaker in line today, we have Pat Hinney. He's the president of an independent consulting company where he assists his clients in defining their strategic direction in wireless communications standardization effort and product development. Pat received a BSSC from the University of Notre Dame. He has over 35 years experience in the design, development, and de deployment of diverse communication systems and product. Uh, and uh, the other uh, helper today here we have is Scott Levine who is with the IEEE Computer Society staff. Uh, and he will be helping us uh, with the logistics for the session. Um, with that brief introduction, let's get today's uh, presentation started. So over to you guys. Okay, uh, thank you, Ritu, for the introduction. Uh, but before I get started, I mentioned that uh, Dorothy is in Ohio, Pat's in uh, Chicago, I'm in New Jersey. Tell us, where are you broadcasting from this morning, or yeah. this morning, my time? I Bangalore, India. Okay. So, and it's around 9.30 p.m. here. <laughs> okay. So we've got uh, good global representation. So thank you very yes. much, uh, Ritu, for hosting us. Uh, I'll briefly cover um, what we do at uh, 802 Landman Standards Committee. As Ritu mentioned, we've been around for 40 years, and it consists of uh, – basically two main areas of uh, uh, technical network standards development, uh, wireline and wireless. And uh, also there's a common uh, component which we handle through our bridging and higher layer uh, architecture. But today we're gonna be focused on two of the big wireless groups within 802. As uh, Ritu mentioned, Dorothy's gonna be talking about 802.11 wireless LANs, commonly known as Wi-Fi and Pat's going to be talking about the wireless specialty uh, networks group. Um, in 802 overall, we've got about 750 uh, active participants. And uh, we meet, when we're meeting face-to-face, -face, which we haven't done for a year, we meet regularly uh, for about a week, uh, six times a year. But since the uh, pandemic, uh, all our meetings have been virtual. And um, we've continued to maintain progress on all the various projects that we've got um, in process. But I wanted to mention that one of the major drivers uh, in 802 and one of the major reasons for success is that uh, we are focused on developing market-relevant, high-quality standards. Uh, we encourage people to come to 802, bring their ideas, demonstrate that there's a viable market and a viable technology to meet that market. And if uh, enough people are uh, agreeing with you, we'll uh, kick off a project and hopefully that'll result in significant commercial success. So that's one of the ingredients, high level ingredients of the success of 802. Uh, just to show you where 802 fits, in the scheme of the IEEE overall, uh, the IEEE overall is a very large organization. I, I don't remember exactly how many members are in it, but it's, I think, north of 400,000 members. And it's broken into uh, five major organizational units of which uh, technical activities and standards are two of the major organizational units. Computer society is in technical activities. 
And uh, under uh, technical activities and the standards association, you see in the green box, the IEEE 802 Land Man Standards Committee. So we've uh, got responsibilities, both of uh, technical activities nature and standards association. Uh, what's done in the standards association is they uh, identify the policies and procedures under which the standards development can occur. And it's very important that it be done in a fair, open, transparent manner such that anyone that has uh, got a uh, interest in participating is able to participate. And we pride ourselves in 802 for the level of openness that we have. And as I mentioned earlier, we've got about 750 uh, volunteers um, working in 802, uh, working extremely hard over the past 40 years to produce the technical specifications that have resulted in an enormous commercial success for components, products, and services based on 802 standards. So I'm very proud of the organization and with that, I am going to hand over the presentation to Dorothy Stanley, the chair of 802.11. And what I'd like to uh, mention is the way we're going to structure the uh, talk today is Dorothy will give her presentation, Pat will give his presentation, and you guys, as we're going through the presentation, please send your questions to us via the uh, Q&A bot. Uh, box, and at the end of the presentations, we'll reserve 15 minutes or so to uh, answer as many of your questions as we can get to. So with that, I hand it over to Dorothy. Thank you very much, Paul. I want to confirm that you the audio is, is good and you're hearing me. You sound good. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, Paul, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I appreciate your attention and interest and the opportunity to speak with you about the work underway in the IEEE Age 11 Working Group. The, my remarks in the next 15 or so odd minutes will be grouped really in three topics. First, we'll talk about the factors underlying Dot 11 product market success. We'll review the technology that's currently under development that's being deployed now and that you can expect to see over the next several years. And then the third part is to focus on some new applications that are under development. And again, to encourage people to participate in the work that is ongoing. So the foundation and the factors in Dow 11 market success, first is regulatory support. Obviously we're wireless technology. Where would we be without spectrum and the ability to broadcast and use the RF uh, frequencies that have been made uh, accessible and available to us? So uh, with that, the uh, obviously regulators uh, globally uh, manage and set the parameters for access to the spectrum. And so uh, we do depend on that for the proliferation and advancement of our technologies. Uh, the second piece is, as Paul mentioned, the market-focused standards development. Uh, we are looking at commercially available technologies and uh, the advancement of those technologies. Uh, the second piece is low-cost and accessible technology. So what we have managed to develop and over the years, and now it's been 30 years, in 2020.11 celebrated its 30-year anniversary of uh, the group formation and development of the DOT 11 standards uh, family and amendments. And what we have seen is that this low cost accessible technology has enabled globally a very virtuous innovation cycle. The technology is accessible to people at a very affordable cost, enabling as talent is global and innovation is global to enable that technology to be used and developed for new applications uh, with a very low barrier to entry for serv new services and business models. Um, here you see the pieces of the puzzle coming together, the regulatory support, the market-based standards. Uh, the, the, uh, the last piece is 
uh, the backwards compatibility. So uh, looking at the regulatory, regulatory support, we see that dot 11 started out in the 2.4 gigahertz band, uh, then moved to uh, five gigahertz. Now there's work underway in six gigahertz, but within those individual bands, products are compatible. The early versions of the standard, products built to those standards and amendments are, are compatible with new generation in those standards, in those bands. So uh, this has enabled development of the market and applications in a very seamless way. Uh, some of the other items listed under market focus development, just to enhance on one of those, uh, responsiveness to the market and technology evolution. So there's been a tremendous amount of hard work by our members over the years to continue uh, a pace with the technology development of chipset uh, chip capabilities, RF capabilities, to rapidly move those technologies into the market. And that is the last piece. So now we'll look, and we'll look at a couple of examples of the innovation that has been enabled by DOT 11. And the example here, customized products using DOT 11 systems for the applications, uh, not just the traditional internet access from home, but remote connectivity, disaster management, and uh, really a lot of applications in developing countries. In August of 2019, I had the honor of speaking at the um, India CDOT um, celebration of 30 years of, of that, uh, that uh, organization being formed. And I'd like to highlight here some of the products that the CDOT group has uh, developed. This is the India Center for Development of Telematics. So some very customized products have been able to be developed and focused on the particular needs of the, the country. Uh, the second example is a, a huge satellite application where you have Wi-Fi hotspots providing internet access to really large numbers of people across vast geographies. So the customization that's possible with the technology can meet these individual needs. Dorothy, I'm gonna pause you there for a second. I, I completely yes. agree. Uh -huh. the the degree of innovation has been amazing. What, what people have been able to do, taking the, the fundamental building blocks that we provided. And I see there bamboo Wi-Fi. You'll have to explain what that is. <laughs> so yeah, this, uh, the example here, you see bamboo Wi-Fi and balloon Wi-Fi. So these are Customized products in case to when there's a disaster situation or other uh, emergency need to provide easy access and rapidly deployable access of communication technology. Uh, the bamboo Wi-Fi is very interesting. So this is a custom form factor uh, where you have effectively a, a miniature access point inside the bamboo uh, structure, if you will. So you're able to provide a very uh, low cost, discrete uh, overlay network, perhaps a mesh network or uh, just regular network access uh, for locations where uh, the, uh, you want the wireless access to be available and to be uh, but not very noticeable. <laughs> okay, I'm sure you have more questions and this is just the beginning of the, the unique applications again, customized that have been developed. Uh, my last example in this segment is another uh, focus on the emergency and disaster recovery applications for Wi-Fi. I encourage you to see the links here. Uh, a number of years ago, there were some issues in uh, Puerto Rico with connectivity, and so Wi-Fi was used to uh, meet some of the needs there. Uh, this, the uh, uh, item that's highlighted here, again, it's the CDOT India example of satellite Wi-Fi, where they've developed a, a unit that can be rapidly deployed in an area where you have the Wi-Fi access for local coverage with coupled with the satellite access for backhaul. And again, you have vast regions with large numbers of people that you need to cover with connectivity. And this is an example of the innovation that has been uh, applied 
with our technology and coupling multiple technologies, uh, including, I'll mention, 802.3 within the devices. We'll call out to 802.3. Uh, so this is the first, uh, that's the end of my fir the first segment, which is talking about the uh, foundations for success of Dot 11 and some of the innovation that it, that has enabled. So now we'll switch to the evolution of the standard and look at the technology in a little more detail. So uh, over the past uh, number of years, roughly a decade, we've seen the development of 11N, also known in the industry as Wi-Fi 4, 11AC, uh, known as Wi-Fi 5 and 11AX. So the, uh, the dates in the parentheses are when the standard was published and typically market deployment of the technology began about two years prior, two to three years prior of the actual publication of the standard. So you can see over time uh, the bands that are supported from 2.4 and five enhancements for five gigahertz, and then the addition of six gigahertz support. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The enhancements in the fundamental radio technology from supporting wider channels from 40 megahertz to 160 uh, megahertz, and then the bandwidths that have been able to be supported. So you see a continuous and really monumental improvement in the speeds that can be supported. So Wi-Fi uh, 6, 11AX, and 6E are being deployed now. Uh, we are currently working on the next amendment that is the major Mac and Phi amendment of DOT 11 to extend the capabilities in across the bands, 2.4, 5, and 6 gigahertz, with even wider channels you see going up to 320 megahertz, increased uh, modulation capabilities, uh, and imp continued improvement in the amount of bandwidth that's supported. So we're ex expecting to see between 30 and 40 gigabits per second supported with 11BE. So as an example of the progression of the technology, an interesting use case and use of all of the flavors of DOT 11, uh, call your attention to this example, which is Wi-Fi in space. Uh, the link is here. You can go to the uh, Wi-Fi Alliance website. Uh, but basically, Wi-Fi is not just uh, essential on Earth. It's also being used for a number of applications in space, uh, on the space station and in astronaut spacesuits. So the example here, again, referring back to the technology and its evolution, the first uh, Deployment of Wi-Fi was in 2008 using Wi-Fi 4. Uh, as recently as 2000, there was a new application based on uh, video, uh, a video application, and a Japanese uh, space agency uh, application. So uh, the technology continues to be used in unique and novel applications. Uh, I, there was a talk recently by uh, Chatwin Lansdowne, who's the subsystem manager for IEEE.11 based communication systems at the International Space Station, and this is his quote, as, it is hard to imagine the space station without Wi-Fi. So it's hard to imagine our lives without Wi-Fi and the access that it provides to the internet and other unique applications, local applications, and this is an example of one. Dorothy, I'm gonna pause uh, you here for a second. I, I think, okay. um, this is an absolute fantastic example of how the Wi-Fi has reached into uh, space. But getting back to your point on how uh, there's a symbiotic relationship between 802.3 Ethernet and uh, 802.11 uh, Wireless LAN, the Wi-Fi, yeah. you guys get a lot of publicity. The Ethernet guys are kind of in the background, but I bet there's a pretty significant wired Ethernet infrastructure inside that capsule to support the Wi-Fi. So I just wanted to make the point that the work we do in 802 is symbiotic and compatibility across media is, is very, very important to the overall uh, success of the, uh, the specifications that we've developed. So I just wanted I, to make that point. Okay. 
Thank you, Paul. Yes, I agree. I agree completely. And one particular dot three uh, standard that has been very foundational to the success on, and the ease of Wi-Fi access point deployment is power over Ethernet. Uh, you know, power over Ethernet allows uh, simple, cost-effective, much uh, faster deployment of Wi-Fi access points. And I think uh, it has been really a foundational piece of the success of uh, Wi-Fi deployments. So call, again, a call out to our 802.3 friends. Good point. Thanks, Dorothy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so times of, times of fleeting, and I do want to make sure Pat has uh, the time that he needs. So very briefly, uh, continuing on on the technology, Wi-Fi 6E, what is Wi-Fi 6E? Wi-Fi 6E is 802.11ax capabilities in the six gigahertz band. And very recently, a couple of weeks ago, the Wi-Fi Alliance announced the availability of interoperability certification for products that support .11ax in the six gigahertz band. Uh, it, a simple internet search will lead you to uh, these uh, materials where you can read about the particular uh, benefits that six gigahertz access will bring. Uh, and the, the summary is here, more spectrum, wider channels, less interference, much higher speeds, low latency and high capacity to support new applications. Uh, there is significant global regulatory activity ongoing for six gigahertz WLAN operation. The countries and regions you see listed here that either have opened the band or are deliberating opening the band. And you have to ask yourself, well, why? The reason is the significant economic value that Wi-Fi brings to the area, to the, to the country. And so regulators really have an obligation to best use the spectrum for the benefit of their, uh, their citizens. And so this is one way by uh, providing regulatory access to Wi-Fi, whether it's in the five gigahertz band, the six gigahertz band, can really benefit a country. And I wanna call out the actions uh, in India in particular for the five gigahertz band that very recent, uh, relatively recently, a lot more spectrum in five gigahertz was made available in India for exactly this purpose and this reason. Within the six gigahertz uh, uh, band, the variety of applications that are envisioned are really quite broad. The example I've highlighted here comes from a, a contribution to the FCC deliberations from Boeing, where they are seeing not only traditional, more consumer-based applications, but a lot of industrial and factory applications that will be enabled uh, by the use of six gigahertz. So, we, um, we've talked about uh, the evolution from 11N, 11AC, 11AX. So a couple of points for 11BE. Uh, the, uh, the applications that are expected to be de uh, deployed are broad. The ca technical capabilities will be industry leading, and this work is under development. I encourage people who are interested in this work to join us. As Paul mentioned, all the 802 and 8211 meetings now are electronic. So uh, people are welcome to join us. Uh, dot 11, a lot of work was done to evaluate 11AX Mac and Phi capabilities against the requirements that are defined in uh, by the ITUR in cases, indoor hotspot and dense urban. I encourage people, uh, if you want to look at uh, simulations and a lot of simulation results, I call your attention to the links provided here. The results of the simulations and the analysis showed that 11AX, MAC, and PHI meet the MAC and PHI requirements established by the ITUR for these use cases. And a lot of this work was done, noting that uh, Rita is coming to us from Bangalore, uh, was done by a couple of engine, uh, two engineers, uh, Sindhu, Burma and Shubhad of Adhikari, who are based in Bangalore. So I salute them and the work that they did uh, to come up with these results. 
So uh, we've talked about the foundations of success for Dot 11, some use cases, innovative use cases that have been enabled. We've talked about the technology that's being deployed today and the new technology that's coming. Uh, the third part of my presentation looks at some new usage models and features. And here I'll briefly highlight additional amendments that are under development to provide additional value, to provide more value add on top of existing deployed dot 11 systems. One is location. We have 11AZ underway to look at more granularity, providing more granularity and positioning. Uh, the automotive 11BD work uh, and Internet of Things, 11BA wake up radio to again, continue to leverage the fundamental te technical capabilities that are there to support new applications. Uh, 11 BC, we're looking at enhanced broadcast services. So you can imagine, uh, as you know, hopefully, <laughs> our systems support both broadcast downlink services and unicast uh, uplink and downlink services. And so now we're looking at extending the broadcast services so the client devices can support a broadcast uplink capability. And so there are a lot of IoT uh, and other applications envisioned for this. 11AZ, next generation positioning. I think that uh, the applications there are clear, again, with a focus on privacy and make sure that privacy is additional, is supported. And then wireless land sensing. So this is the capability of using the RF finger, uh, uh, RF um, environment to gather data and infer data about the environment. And the, again, the use cases are broad from smart home uh, gaming and gesture recognition and uh, presence and proximity detection for uh, numerous applications in those spaces. So again, adding value, continue to add value and bring economic benefit to assist to Wi-Fi users and society at large. I'll close with one another example to close off with another uh, innovative solution. Uh, here's Project Owl, uh, developed by some students, some you know some college students, to basically uh, create a live internet uh, network across a whole a square mile, and they're looking at uh, new and novel applications. So returning to the point about the technology being accessible for global for innovation globally. And this is a fundamental foundation for success and we anticipate uh, new innovations and uh, continuing along that path. So Paul, my presentation here, uh, and happy to take questions. Uh, there are some additional useful links if you'd like to uh, further uh, get information about the work that's ongoing. Very good. Thank you, Dorothy, for that overview. And yes, I'd like to uh, reiterate, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A chat box and we'll get to that after uh, Pat's done with his presentation. Now we're going to move on to uh, Pat Kinney, who is the chair of the 802.15 Wireless Specialty Networks Working Group. Uh, Pat, it's all yours. Thanks, Paul. And as Paul mentioned, I'm Pat Kinney, and um, I am the working group chair of Ada215, which is wireless specialty networks. Um, unlike DOT3, uh, Ada215, uh, Ada215 is different, and Ada211 also uh, is different from us. There are many standards that are really too small, um, or the groups are too small to uh, devote a whole work group to. So um, we um, put all these into A to 215, and they are diverse applications, and they range from RFID to uh, body implantable networks, utility meters, uh, to pipeline monitoring, from kiosks, um, very, very short range, like 10 centimeters, to very long-range broadband networks, as in um, 802.15.16t, and I'll get into those. The standards uh, within 802.15, and again, we're slightly different than some of the other work groups. We have uh, multiple uh, MACs, um, many, many FISs, as most groups do, but our uh, MACs are unique to each standard. And so we have 15.3, 15.4. 15.4 actually has three subsidiary uh, standards, ancillary standards. 
uh, like key management protocol uh, feeding into it. And then we have a body airing network, 15.6, uh, optic communications, 15.7, and then uh, peer aware communications, 15.8. And then um, we have some new ones that haven't come on yet, but um, 15.13, which is very high speed optical communications. And then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, 16T, which is an, an amendment to 802.16. If I could move on to 802.15.3, this is a uh, high speed, uh, very low cost uh, network. Um, it has very, very uh, fast join times and uh, very high speed um, up uh, downloads in, in the 100 to 200 gigabit per second range. Um, we've seen uh, one uh, example of it being used for kiosks where when you have a, uh, a phone, it can be programmed with a, a movie in a very short, well under one second time. Um, so um, it hits the, the need for um, uploading and downloading um, in a mobile environment. It is also used though in data centers and wireless videos. 802.15.4 is probably the, the most, is the largest uh, standard as far as volumes go and as far as um, amendments go. Some of the characteristics of 802.15.4 um, for the last, um, let's say 17 years, Mesh configurations, it's always had mesh and it's always been critical. Um, and also met, uh, maintaining a bat device's battery life of over 10 years, very, very critical. So very low energy and very wide coverage uh, via the mesh. And uh, different ranges as far as bandwidth goes. Um, the narrow band uh, sections, allow for a very long range of 20 uh, kilometers, but um, the UWB, the ultra wide band, uh, can uh, be used to do, uh, determine um, location awareness down to 10 centimeters and even less in some cases. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, 15.9, um, 15.10 standards provides key management protocol and then a layer two routing protocol for 15.4 devices. Technologies uh, supported by 802.15.4, ultra wideband and narrow band are critical, but then so are the security time slotted channel hopping, which is used for industrial networks um, such as HART, and then mesh networking, uh, which is actually used by almost all of the deployments. Uh, link layer control sublayer, as I mentioned earlier, uh, key management protocol and layer two routing. And then uh, we have, uh, for applications, we have sensing and controller, smart utility meters, uh, uh, which is uh, smart utility networks, using mesh networks to replace the need for wired connectivity in over hundreds of miles. Um, pipeline integrity, uh, use uh, like water, petroleum, and so on, using narrowband for the long ranges. Railway um, in the US uh, having positive train control application for safety. The uh, industrial automation sensors and controllers, as I mentioned, for wireless heart or ISA 100, use the TSCH for deterministic behavior. Commercial building lighting control networks using mesh networks to eliminate the need to run extra cables so you can do retrofits very easily. Um, and the batteries mean that no power is needed as well. Consumer electronics, such as cable set, top boxes and so on, integrated uh, audiovisual and home theater control, and then home automation applications such as remote controls, lighting, and uh, HVAC controls. And then uh, ranging applications, uh, automotive wireless key devices are now becoming, uh, are coming into effect with um, the 802.15.4 UWB. Uh, along with um, the ability to determine where a network device is and then access control. Um, you don't want uh, to access a door unless you're right at the door. RFID applications. Excuse me, Pat. Pat, yes. maybe you can explain a little bit about what UWB is, ultra wideband, and how that's different from the typical modulation schemes we use. Thank you. Ultra-wideband is uh, defined by the uh, our regulatory 
as greater than 500 megahertz uh, uh, bandwidth versus like a narrow band, which could be uh, well under a megahertz. And uh, the ultra wide band gives you the capability then of doing some very, very fine resolution of uh, ranging. So you can do a, um, a time of arrival techniques to uh, get down to the centimeters. It also allows you to uh, spread out your energy over a very large bandwidth, and therefore, um, like the um, uh, the energy in a, a typical transmission is, is under minus 43 dBm, way underneath uh, almost every other device. So it's very good coexistence properties. So ultra wideband is going to be. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more further into the discussion. But it, it is a innovative technology that's actually been with 802.15.4 since the beginning. And moving on to uh, body area network, um, that's a standard for short range, low power and highly reliable wireless communication for either on the body or inside the body. And it provides communication links in around the body and uh, for sensors, actuators, and processing elements. If, if you uh, to look at the uh, standard, it has one media access control, uh, but it has three uh, phys. A, uh, it has a narrow band, it has an ultra wide band, and then it has a human body uh, communication technique where the, the cells of the body are actually uh, uh, the media for the, um, the RF. Applications are many and, and many more coming. Physiological and vital signs monitoring, neurostimulators, uh, remote control medical devices, disability, elderly people, fitness monitoring, and then wearable audio, video. Then uh, we get out of the, uh, let's say the RF zone and uh, move into visible light communications. Um, 802.15.7 uses visible light uh, and it gives us access to uh, hundreds of terahertz of unlicensed spectrum. So that's very good uh, as far as regulatory issues. You don't have to worry about them. Avoidance of electromagnetic and RF interference are some more features. Uh, additional security because uh, you know where the communication is going. You can see it and there's no eavesdropping beyond walls. And then it can also be used to augment and complement existing services, such as um, your, your building lights, such as your headlights on your car, your taillights on your LEDs. LEDs. So um, we can use existing, and on your phone, the, uh, the camera, the flash and the camera can form 802.15.7 uh, links. The application scenarios, I, I can uh, just allow you just to look at these later on but they're all over the place. The camera, as we mentioned, e-display, um, the lights um, in, in the buildings, and um, the uh, traffic light symbols and uh, the um, street lights can also provide the communication. Next up, I, I'd like to talk about 802.15.16T. Um, now, that's a, pro, uh, a project for very uh, long distances, um, let's say upwards of 50 miles. And uh, it's in the license spectrum uh, with um, relatively narrow for, uh, for a 16 device, um, 5 kilohertz, uh, less than 100 kilohertz. And um, while it's frequency independent, uh, the standard is written that way, the spectrum focused on is, is less than 2 gigahertz. In fact, um, less than 1 gigahertz gives it even better range. And so it's, it's a standard error interface, um, and uh, the focus is on uh, critical organizations like electrical utilities, oil and gas, rail services, um, drones, government, uh, security, and others. And um, it's uh, focusing on the mission critical Internet of Things. Um, and they're, they're also looking at uh, different message lengths and periodicities and so on. They can uh, be used for video audio, though, and uh, they suspect that that will be uh, one more application in that use. Ultra wideband, the next generation. 
Um, ultra wideband, the latest ultra wideband amendment, uh, 4Z, uh, there's been two other ones earlier, was approved in 2020. The uh, ultra wideband standard has hit a lot of uh, different um, participation levels for us. Automotive is really interested in it, as are the um, companies uh, in, um, well, mobile telephones are very, very big into it other high volume markets, um, they need very high security for both communications and location. So your location can't be given away, neither can your the intelligence in your communications. Low power, um, button cell batteries are the biggest ones that they can uh, afford in some of these applications. Um, short communication packets, obviously for the low energy, accurate and consistent ranging determination and uh, on consistent ranging determination, you don't want a range that's bouncing around and saying, oh, it's five meters away. Nope, it's 20 meters away, and, and so on. You want something that gives you accurate, immediate, and consistent. And so uh, devices uh, for 4Z are in today's mobile phones, uh, smartwatches, and many automobiles. And they're used all around the, I mean, in, in automobiles for many different needs and uh, smartwatches and mobile phones to determine where other devices are. And the marketplace is expected to grow significantly in the next four years, four to five years for smartphones and smartphone accessories, um, automotive wireless keys and, and so on. And uh, there's the market growth. It's already into hundreds of millions and um, Quite now, right now, it's probably in the 200s of millions, but it's, it's supposed to go way above that. And uh, finally, um, the group right now, we have an interest group. Um, in in uh, 80215, we have interest groups, study groups, and then task groups. And an interest group is just a group of people saying, what can we do next? And they're working on strategies to enhance the uh, UWB standard to uh, increase the speed of UWB, to send files uh, more securely and, and to uh, larger files to locations. And then uh, low latency, high quality audio for spatial and immersive audio. And then the location accuracies enable uh, um, uh, AR display, augmented reality display to help you locate other U UWB devices so that Let's say your phone, your uh, smartphone, can uh, show you a display of everything in your room. And then uh, since the accuracy of UWB is so good, it will superimpose um, where the device is. If it's hiding, let's say, in the couch or something of that sort. And then decreasing the energy usage of UWB uh, allows smart home devices like smart locks to communicate faster, longer, and with more security. And then here's some key links key to, links look, into, to look into uh, as to uh, what else is going on in, in NATO 2. That's it for my presentation, Paul. Uh, that's great. And I'm glad you uh, ended on the, um, the uh, interest group activity because I want to point out that one of the uh, key areas uh, of success for 802 has been the openness and uh, our uh, strong interest in bringing parties that think that they may have technologies that would benefit from being standardized to 802. And we've got a number of uh, mechanisms of doing it. The interest group is one of them. Uh, Next Generation Wireless is another one of them that is done uh, within both uh, 802.11 and 802.15. So we encourage new people to come in. Uh, this very low barrier to entry, I think, has been a big part of the success of the organization. If you, you can be a single individual with your own new idea and your own company, and if you, you can bring it into 802 and convince enough people that it's worth uh, starting a project on, we'll start it. Or you can come from large companies, and we've got you know a number of uh, of people that have um, done that. So, uh, being individual based is one of the strengths of 802 that I'm particularly uh, proud of, and and it's one of the reasons we have such a large, active participant base. 
Um, so, so just to wrap up, um, we gave you an overview of uh, what's going on, on on two of our big wireless groups. And I thought there was an interesting question, and maybe we'll end with this, is uh, one gentleman asked, I know IEEE 802.11 is also working on visible light communications. What's the difference with 802.15, visible light communication? So, um, Pat, I'm going to give you the first crack at answering that, and then uh, we'll go to Dorothy. Okay, thanks. Actually, there's two groups within 802.15 looking at um, uh, visible light communication. The first one that I mentioned was uh, dot seven, and that one is looking for, um, let's say, lower speeds, um, not very uh, high as far as, let's say, uh, 10 to 100 megabit per second. We're looking under 10 megabit per second, but we're looking from different um, light sources like um, I, again, like your headlamps on a car, your tail lamps on a car, uh, your um, room lighting, the, the LED room lights, and so on. So we're looking for um, basically overall connectivity, whereas we have a, another group is, is much higher data rate. Um, and that, by the way, is 802.15.13. Um, they haven't a standard yet, but they're developing a standard. And uh, they have, uh, in 802.15, the ability to, uh, to create their own Mac and therefore their own uh, user interface. And, and I, I think, and I'll let Dorothy take over from here, but um, having the, uh, the ability to determine a, a different interface uh, than uh, an existing Mac is, is helpful for some uh, applications. Dorothy? Thank you, Pat. I apologize if there's some background noise here, but uh, excellent question. Thank you. The work in dot 11 is unique in that it is leveraging as much as possible the 802.11 based Mac. So the dot 11 based Mac is something that's widely implemented and understood. Uh, additionally, the interfaces northbound from the Mac leverage all of the IETF protocol stacks and layers to leverage all of the dot 11 Mac and upper layers using the uh, Light Communications Spy. Okay, great. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, and I'm going to um, wrap up with this one last question that we've got uh, with respect to uh, how would you recommend a young professional uh, get involved in standards activities? And I think that's a, a particularly good one because I know that some people may feel like, oh my God, you know, these are seasoned professionals. How can I come into there and uh, establish uh, any kind of credibility? And I, for one, uh, strongly encourage our young professionals to come in and engage. I know that at one time, uh, 35 plus years ago, I was one of those young people and I strolled into 802.3 and was welcomed and immediately became able to contribute to the 10 base T standard, which uh, launched a large uh, market in uh, twisted pair uh, Ethernet. So, uh, Dorothy, maybe you can give your perspective and Pat, you can give your perspective and then we'll uh, wrap it up. Thank you, Paul. Standards development is a team effort. It is a huge, generally long-term effort. And we always need people to contribute, to participate, to bring ideas. Uh, another aspect is you have a lot of really smart, talented people getting together. And when you have that mix of ideas going back and forth and collaboration uh, being uh, occurring, uh, new ideas come and enhancements are identified. So I would encourage people not to be intimidated. Uh, there's a lot to learn. Uh, I remember first dot 11 meeting I attended, I looked at the whole thing. I said, oh my gosh, what's going on here? You know, and here I am all these years later. So 
Uh, I encourage people to participate. I encourage uh, you to follow our activities, ours and others online. Uh, get involved, uh, learn. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to contribute. Thanks. Fantastic, Dorothy. Pat, your wisdom. Thank you. Um, I agree with everything that both of you have said. Um, first of all, uh, participating in the um, IEEE 802 right now is probably the easiest it's ever been because you don't have to travel. Um, you can uh, take part in, in all the WebEx communications. Uh, and meeting the different people from all over the world um, not only uh, helps you intellectually, but also you get to know the people personally. And that type of networking is something that um, you should never pass up. Um, I would like to then end by uh, commenting on one of Paul's points. He says, even a single person can come in and do tremendous things. Actually, Paul, a single person came in and started the 802.15.4 uh, standard. So uh, hundreds of millions came from one person. Thank you. There you go. That's an excellent, excellent uh, wrap up. And and just to, just to emphasize what Pat said, um, right now you participate. You know, you just come in and go to the IEEE802.org webpage and you'll see all the working groups listed there. And you can go to their home pages and all the meetings that the electronic meetings that they're holding are identified um, in the 802 calendar and just come in, uh, observe what's going on. All of our presentations are available online. Um, it's completely open. And uh, that's the way to get started. You figure out the area that you want to get involved in. And then once you've got uh, a good idea of what that is, come in and uh, join the conversation. So with that, I'd like to wrap it up. Thank you, everyone that's uh, participated, especially thank you very much to Pat and Dorothy and Ritu and Scott for hosting this. We hope that this has been an informative and useful webinar. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll take it from here on. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Dorothy and Pat and Scott for helping out. And I would also like to thank all of you for attending. Um, just one uh, information, our next standards activity board web webinar series uh, will be on 18th February at 11 a.m. EST. Uh, and we'll be hearing about the 2021 overview and update of the cybersecurity and privacy standards. Uh, registration is now open and we'll be sending out you a link of these future events in a follow-up email later today and along with the slides and the recording of this webinar. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye.